All right, welcome. It's time to talk about how we calculate all the various returns that exist. So in this section, I'm going to introduce you to the concepts behind our primary return measures. I'll discuss how we manage the risk associated with returns and also talk about how we adjust for inflation. We'll talk about the differences between geometric and arithmetic returns and do some work with that. And then we'll review the internal rate of return. Okay, now when we talk about a return, what we mean is the profit on an investment scaled by the amount you invested. Your profit comes in two forms. The first is income during the investment period, sometimes in the form of a dividend or rental income. And the second is the profit that you gain it through straight up capital gains on the security. The capital gain is the increase in the value of the security. If I were to say a capital loss, that would indicate that the value of the security fell over the investment period. So here we have arguably the two most important formulas in all of finance, the return formula and the holding period return formula. Not much of a difference here. Really the only difference here is with the holding period return formula, we automatically include the income or dividend in the formula with returns, uh, you know, our, our basic return formula just assumes that, you know, we, we don't have any income. If you ever are calculating a return, always default to the holding period return formula. Uh, that That's the main logic here. But basically, our return is just the price at the end of the period at minus the price at the beginning, all divided by the price at the beginning. Or we could do this a little different, say price at the end minus divided by price at beginning minus one. Holding period return we're adding in the dividend or any or income that the investor receives during the investment period uh, because that is a form of return. So price at the end minus price at the beginning plus dividend all divided by price at the beginning. Okay, so let's use these formulas. So quick example, a one year zero coupon municipal bond is currently trading at $80. It will mature at its face value of $100 what is the annual return on this bond? Well, we use our return formula. We don't have any uh, coupon payments or income, so you know we don't have a D here. So we have the price at the end, which is 100, minus the price at the beginning, which is 80, all divided by price at the beginning of 80. So our return is 25%. Okay, now let's take a look at the holding period return formula. So you purchased a share of Tesla stock for 150 exactly one year ago. The share paid $1.50 dividend today, and you're deciding to sell the stock today for $205. What is your holding period return? Well, here's our formula. And we have the price at the end minus the price at the beginning plus any income we received during the holding period, which in this case is the $1.50. Uh, and then divide by the price at the beginning. Holding period return, 37.67%. Okay, now we have those two return formulas, but there's a lot of other return formulas that we use. I mean, this is by no means a comprehensive list. Uh, we'll discuss a lot of these formulas in class, uh, but they're all built on the basic uh, return or holding period return formulas. Now let's talk about historical returns around the world, since you should have some basic understanding of historical returns over long periods of time. So what I did was I went out and collected some data over an extremely long period of time, 1900 through 2014. This came from BlackRock. And what I'd like you to notice first is that, let's say we take the United States. Stocks have historically outperformed bonds or long-term bonds, which have historically outperformed short-term government bonds, which has historically outperformed inflation. Uh, now, this is a phenomenon that we typically talk about all the time in finance. Essentially, uh, stocks have higher risk and therefore investors should demand higher compensation than investors in bonds. So this is why we, we typically see this. We'll look at this in way more detail later in the class. Uh, the difference between the long-term and the short-term bonds is pretty significant here. 1.2% you know, annually over the last hundred or 115 year period, that's significant. Uh, the thing that most likely drives this is the maturity risk premium. Investors are essentially 
taking a bigger risk by investing in long-term bonds because there's more likelihood that the issuer could default over the longer time period than they could on short-term government bonds. In this case, it's the U.S. federal government. And lastly, inflation. Inflation should be the lowest thing here. If it wasn't, uh, let's say inflation was higher than short-term government, uh, government bonds or T-bills, there'd be no reason for anyone to invest in T-bills because your, your real return would actually be negative. So you'd want to invest in stocks or long-term bonds. Okay, now let's talk about nominal versus real returns. A nominal return is the return that gets reported in the press. Almost every return you've heard of is a nominal return. Stock returns are nominal returns. The return on any kind of investment that you calculate uh, is going to be a nominal return. Uh, now this nominal return is the return the investment earns expressed in current dollars. It doesn't account for the effects of inflation. A real return, on the other hand, is the return adjusted for the change in total purchasing power. A real return is a nominal return adjusted for inflation. And it's, it's essentially our best metric for how our purchasing power changed. Okay, as you're hopefully aware from your macroeconomics courses, inflation measures the relative purchasing power of a dollar. If you could purchase a burger for a dollar yesterday, but today you have to spend a dollar fifty to purchase the same burger, your purchasing power decreased. This is why we care about real returns. And when we measure inflation, what we'll typically do is use the consumer pricing index or the consumer price index, also called the CPI. And the CPI in the U.S. is tracked and reported by the Federal Reserve on the for, on the Fed's FRED website. Uh, just if you want to have some fun, look at the FRED website. It has arguably the most macroeconomic data in the United States today. It is a website we'll use frequently. Uh, now, the FRED website tracks the, or rather, the, the CPI tracks the cost to purchase the same basket of goods over time. If the cost of that basket of goods... Uh, rises, what this means is that the dollar is depreciating and inflation is rising. So let's take a look at this. Okay, so here we have the CPI for all cons urban consumers. This is just on the FRED website that I mentioned. Uh, it's put together by the St. Louis Federal Reserve. Uh, there's an enormous amount of macro data here that you can uh, grab. Now, like I said, the CPI just tracks the price of a basket of goods. This includes bread, milk, uh, cars, you know, a huge number of items. And obviously, the CPI is rising most of the time. What this indicates is that the value of a dollar is falling, or, you know, the, the amount of dollars it would take to purchase that same basket of goods is increasing. Now, if we want to get a sense of the change in the CPI, we would typically call this inflation. What we can do is change this to something like Oh, the percent change from, let's say, a year ago. So here we go. And let's say we want it, oh, one year. So here we have our inflation over the last year. So this is the metric that will often get reported. So inflation in the last month, 2.97%. Uh, prior to that, 3.25%. And obviously in the last five years, uh, we had this big bubble of inflation. We had very, very high inflation in early 2022. Okay, now let's talk about how we account for, for inflation. The primary way we adjust returns for inflation is by using what's called the Fisher equation down here. And the Fisher equation literally just says one plus the real return, the rate real, is equal to one plus your nominal return, the quoted return, divided by one plus your inflation metric. So this is where we put the change in the CPI right here. And there's a modified form of the Fisher equation, which is just real equals nominal minus inflation, but over, you know, this is the more accurate, accurate metric. Okay, so I wanted to show you exactly how big of an impact inflation can have on assets. So what I did was I put together this example. So we hear this frequently quoted statistic that the historical market return in the U.S. over the last 80 years has been about 8%. You can measure it differently and get like 9%, 10%, 11%, but we'll say 
The average annual inflation over the last 100 years is 3.3%. Uh, how big of an impact does this make annually? Well, this 8%, this is a nominal return because it's, it's the quoted return. If we wanted to get the real return, what we'd have to do is use the Fisher equation. So take 1 plus 8% divided by 1 plus 3.3%, and that would get us 1 plus our real return. And what I've done here is I've plotted the purchasing power of a dollar invested in year zero by the end of 40 years, or uh, I guess 40 years. And what you can see here is if you just invested a dollar and got the nominal rate and didn't take into account the the effects of inflation, that dollar would have a purchasing power of, oh, $22-ish today, or at the end of 40 years. But once you take into account inflation, that dollar's purchasing power only went from $1 at the start of this period to about, oh, we'll say $6 by the end of it. So this is the reason that inflation is a big deal. It can dramatically in, eat into your returns. Okay, so let's take a look at an example that shows this. So I, I use some real world data here just to show you why we care so much about this. So the yield on the Turkish government bonds was recently raised to 45%. So that's your, your nominal return. A pretty good return. The expected inflation rate in the next year was estimated at 65% at the time I pulled this data though. Uh, what is the real rate of return a Turkish investor would earn on an investment in Turkish government bonds? And round to the closest basis point or hundredth of percent. Well, we start with the Fisher equation. So one plus our real return is equal to one plus nominal divided by one plus inflation. So here we have our 45%, so 1.45 in the numerator divided by 1.65 in the denominator. And once I subtract that one from both sides, what I get is a real return of negative 12.12%. So even though we have a very high return on Turkish government bonds, the market where you're having to hold your money has hyperinflation, which is not a good thing, or it did at the time that I collected this data. So this is a case where you would absolutely not want to invest in those bonds. Okay, uh, one more example, and this one's a little more complicated because I'm asking you to actually calculate the inflation. So the return on the market over the last year was 14%. Over the same time period, the CPI increased from 200 to 210. What was the real return on the market, so after controlling for inflation? Well, we know our nominal return, that's 14%. And the way we calculate inflation is just by calculating the percentage change in the CPI. So it's essentially just the return formula. The CPI at the end minus the CPI at the beginning of the period divided by the CPI at the beginning of the period. So 210 minus 200, all divided by 200, gives us inflation over this year of 5%. So we just plug this information into the Fisher equation and we get 1.14 in the d numerator divided by 1.05 and we'll subtract one from that to get rid of this on the left-hand side. And what we're left with is a real return of 8.57%. Not bad. Okay, now let's take a look at the difference between the annual percentage rate or APR and the effective annual rate or EAR. Now the APR is a simple interest rate that doesn't take into account the benefits of compound interest. We calculate the APR by multiplying the periodic interest rate by the number of compounding periods, also referred to in our notation as M. Now the number of compounding periods is one for annual compounding, but it's 12 for monthly compounding and 365 for daily compounding. The EAR, on the other hand, is our real rate of return and this accounts for compound interest. We calculate the EAR by taking the quantity of one plus the periodic interest rate to the power of M minus one. We can calculate the EAR using the APR and vice versa. So let's go ahead and use these in a problem. Okay, so you own an asset which has a one basis point daily interest rate, assuming daily compounding. What are the APR and the EAR? Okay, so I just have the formulas here, so let's go through it and then I'll show it in Excel. So our APR is just our periodic interest rate, so our daily interest rate times number of compounding periods. So one basis point or one hundredth of a percent times 365. 
So APR 3.65. EAR, we plug in our periodic interest rate into essentially our time value of money formula. So one plus one basis point. So 1.0001 to the power of 365 minus one. And we have an EAR of 3.72%. So notice here that our APR is less than our EAR. Anytime you have something other than annual compounding, that'll be the case. Your EAR, because you're doing, uh, you're, you're engaging in compound interest or you're getting compound interest, your EAR will always be greater than your APR when you have monthly compounding or uh, daily compounding. Okay, so I did want to show you how you can use Excel to get the APR and EAR, because that's pretty important. Uh, so here we have our periodic interest rate of one basis point. To get our APR, obviously we can just take our one basis point times 365. So there we go, and I'll put all these in percentage terms. Now if we have an APR, and we want to get an EAR. Yes, I could use the formula I just showed you, but in Excel, there's actually two formulas that allow us to just plug in numbers and we'll calculate the EAR and APR directly. So the first one I should show you is the effect or effective annual rate formula. So we just plug in our nominal rate, which is the APR, and identify the number of periods each year. So in this case, it'd be 365. And there we go. We have our EAR from this, well, this is our EAR. Now, if we wanted to get from an EAR to an APR, all we'd need to do is just type the, the nominal formula, and that'll get us our APR. All we have to put in is our EAR, or effective rate, and the number of uh, periods, or periodic payments, so M365. And there we go, we're back to our APR. So I just thought I should show you that because you know we should know how to do all this stuff in Excel. Okay, now let's talk about the arithmetic versus geometric averages, both of which are used in investments. An arithmetic average is that thing you learned in like third grade. It's just the sum of all the values divided by the number of values. So here it is right here. We just sum up all of our returns at each time t and divide by the number of periods we have. So, you know, that's it. There's nothing uh, crazy about that. Uh, in finance, we very often want to calculate the arithmetic average return. It's useful. Uh, we'll use it a bunch in this class, obviously. Uh, yeah. Now, the, the more complicated average we have is the geometric average. And the geometric average return is the average return you would need in each period in order to start with a certain amount and end with the amount that you have at the end of your time period. In other words, if you started with $1,000 in your brokerage account and ended five years later with $2,000, the return over that period that would get you from 1,000 to 2,000 is your geometric average return. Uh, in case you're wondering, the geometric average return would be 14.87% in that example. Uh, now the geometric average return in later periods are typically more heavily weighted. Uh, but basically what we do is we, to get our geometric average return, we take the product, that's what this sign means, of all of our one plus returns over a certain time series. So, you know, multiply each of those by each other, and then take those to the power of one divided by the number of time periods, n, and subtract one. So let's take a look at an example. Okay, so in this example, we have Netflix's stock in 2002 through 2005. So we know the price at the beginning, the dividend paid, and the price at the end of the year. Obviously, I, I just put some numbers in here and said, oh, this is Netflix's stock. So let's calculate the arithmetic and geometric average holding period returns over this four-year period. Okay, so here we go. We have a spreadsheet. I always think it's better to do this in a spreadsheet. Uh, yeah, it's just way more straightforward. Okay, so here we have our data. And first thing we need to do, if we wanna calculate either our arithmetic average or geometric average return, I should put return here, return. 
there we go, is we need to calculate the return in each year. So we have a dividend, so we're going to calculate our holding period return. So equals price at the end minus price at the beginning plus the dividend all divided by the price at the beginning. Okay, so there we go. 14% return 2020 or 2002. Now, if you're not familiar with this formula, you're going to get some serious benefit out of this. You can actually copy formulas down columns or cross rows simply by clicking on this little square that you see right here and dragging down. So what I do when I do that is I'm literally just dragging the formula down and the input cells will also be dragged down. So here we have just our holding period return formula for 2005. And there we go. Here are our holding period returns. So our arithmetic average return I mean, we could do this many different ways. We could just do a sum of all of these and divide by four. We could also just take the average formula. Uh, we could, I mean, you could just add them up directly, whatever you want to do, but you know, just arithmetic average. All right, now the more complicated thing, geometric average return. So this is the one where we multiply one plus each of these returns by each other, take it to the power of one divided by n and subtract one. So I'll tell you what, this first time I'll just put in the numbers directly so you can see what I'm doing. So we have one plus 14% times one plus negative 0.1455 times one plus Point one times one plus point oh seven three seven. And there we go. Hopefully I don't have too many parentheses. And we'll take that to the power of one divided by four because we have four returns in this time series. And we'll subtract one. Oh, I should probably put an equal sign in there, shouldn't I? There we go. 3.57%. All right, so that is the long way of doing that. Uh, I would not recommend doing that ever, ever, ever. Uh, better way to do that is to either just take, you know, one plus each of these returns and, you know, create a formula that links to these. Or better yet, uh, you could do in a separate column, you could take one plus this return, copy that down and then use those one plus returns in your formula. You know, you're trying to calculate the geometric average return. Uh, this would be the way that I truly think that you should calculate it every single time. There's a formula out there called GeoMean. And basically what this does is it takes the product of whatever one plus returns you have and takes that to the power of one divided by N. So all we have to do when we use the GeoMean formula is just take that set of one plus holding period returns, subtract one, and bam, out comes our geometric average return. Uh, if you're calculating a geometric average, this, this really is the first thing that you should try to do. Especially since you might not have just like four numbers here, you might have like a thousand returns. And this formula makes it very, very easy. Okay. Now, let me refresh your memories on the internal rate of return. Uh, so something you should have seen in your Finance 300 classes, uh, but obviously very important in investments. Now, the IRR is the discount rate that equates an investment's cost to the present value of all the benefits that that investment provides to the investor. Uh, we calculate it using both Excel and the BA2 calculator. Uh, there's other ways to calculate it. Notably, though, you can't calculate this by hand without trial and error. Uh, so inevitably in our class, I mean, I'm just going to tell you, use the IRR formula. Uh, basically, you know, it's, it's the easiest thing. Uh, so let's go ahead and just calculate our internal rate of return. So here we have a very quick example. We have two stocks and we know the cash flows. So we're investing $1,000 in each of these. This negative 1,000 indicates that this is a cash outflow from our perspective, from the investor's perspective. 
and then the positive values indicate that we're getting cash inflows. So uh, we need these negatives and positives to indicate uh, whether we're sending money out or bringing money in. So from this, we can calculate the IRR. So let's do that. Okay, so here we have our data and the IRR formula, pretty straightforward. We just, in Excel, it's just equals IRR and we just highlight our cash flow stream. There we go. And we can copy this formula over. Yep, there it is. Now, I, I probably should show you how to do this on the BA2 calculator. That would be a certainly a good thing to do. So allow me to do that. All right, so here we have our BA2 calculator. And first thing I want to do, if I'm just cracking this open, uh, notice here that I have uh, just two places past the decimal. I'll change that by going to format and putting in a nine here. And that gets us our floating decimal. And next thing we want to do is we want to enter in our cash flows. So our cash flow zero is negative 1000. And we'll lock that in by hitting the enter button, hit the down arrow. Cash flow one is 30, enter. Frequency of four, so I'll put in four here for four years. And then cash flow two, the next cash flow is 1250. Got it locked in and frequency is default one. All right, to calculate the IRR, I just go to the IRR button and click compute. And there we go, 6.8 four-ish percent. So yeah, that's how we use the cash flow buttons on the BA2 calculator. Uh, if you need to clear out those buttons, all you need to do is just be in the cash flow button and just hit uh, second clear work and that'll clear all your cash flows. So that's that. All right, so let's summarize what we talked about. There are many formulas for returns in investments. We talked about APR, EAR, IRR, the holding period return formula. Uh, now we're going to use the return and holding period reform, uh, return formulas pretty much every single day going forward. It's just, you know, an assumption that you're able to just do that on the fly. I absolutely will expect you to be able to work many of these on the first exam. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're not in for a good time. Uh, the real return is the return or the nominal return adjusted for inflation and our geometric average return, which we talked about, that's the average periodic return it takes you to get from your, the start of your investment period to the end of your investment period. So the amount you started with to the amount you ended with over whatever your investment time uh, horizon was. So with that, I'm going to conclude. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you.